Hey everyone, it's Tony with Hidden Light Photography, and in my resolution video, we touched base on oversampling and undersampling, and I said that in the next video, we would go deeper into that, and that's exactly what we're going to do today. And if you find this video useful, make sure to hit that like and subscribe button. I don't want you to miss out on any useful information. Now let's jump in and learn about oversampling and undersampling. Let's start simple. What is undersampling? Undersampling is when your pixels are too large for the detail your telescope could resolve. Think of it as trying to build a detailed sculpture using giant Lego blocks. The giant blocks are just too big to get intricate detail. When it comes to your telescope and camera, when you have huge pixels, the fine features of a galaxy or nebula just disappear. Stars become squares, edges become jagged. Oversampling, on the other hand, is when your pixels are too small for your atmospheric seeing. This means you're trying to record detail that the sky isn't actually giving you. The atmosphere is blurring everything before it hits your camera sensor. This results in images that look soft or mushy, even if your focus and tracking are perfect. The Goldilocks zone is when your pixels are not too big, not too small. The pixels match your sky conditions and your telescope's optical resolution. That's where the magic happens. So how do we see this? Let me show you something. Here we have a grid. Let's pretend this grid are the pixels of our camera sensor. I'm going to show you how oversampling and undersampling work. Let's put a dot on the grid. This dot represents the photons from a star. Notice how this star's photons cover multiple pixels. This is good, and this gives us resolution. The multiple pixels can resolve the roundness of the star. Now let's consider seeing. Seeing is the turbulence of the atmosphere. This is where things can get a bit messy. The more turbulent the atmosphere, the worse your seeing is, and the more the photons scatter. A less turbulent atmosphere means better seeing, and the less the photons scatter. At first glance, seeing how the star's photons land across the pixels, it's tempting to think we're good. And for a very quick exposure, this would be good. However, in astrophotography, we use long exposures to capture the faint objects we're imaging. When the seeing conditions scatter our photons during long exposures, our star's photons can land here, here, maybe some here, and maybe some over here, all before our exposure finishes. Now this looks good, and for this particular camera and telescope combination with this particular seeing, it is good. But for a more turbulent atmosphere, by the time we're done with our exposure, we may look something like this. Notice how we're scattered. Notice the shape of our star and those small pixels can resolve that because of how small they are. This is where stars and detail can start to get mushy and lost. And when you consider guiding, it's now easier to see and understand why strict guiding is necessary. Any guiding errors would be blatantly obvious and amplify this effect. Let's take the same star shape from the same exposure and same hypothetical seeing conditions, but let's change the pixel scale. Let's take a look at large pixels. Notice how even though we have an identical scenario, changing the pixel scale to larger pixels, we're fitted inside four pixels. What do you think this is and what this leads to? If you said undersampling, you're exactly right. Notice how this would lead to a square star. We're not fitting across enough pixels to resolve detail. We'll look blocky and we won't have the resolution capability to resolve any detail. Let's pretend we had even worse seeing and these photons got scattered even further. We can see how they would cover more pixels, thus bringing us closer to good sampling. Think of undersampling as not covering enough pixels. We're underdoing it. Now, let's take a look at the good middle ground. Pixels not too big, not too small, and using the same star shape, exposure, and seeing. 
Notice how we cover just enough pixels to get good shape without overdoing it or underdoing it. This is a well-matched camera and telescope combination, thus giving us ideal sampling. So what causes oversampling and undersampling? Undersampling happens when your pixels are too large, your focal length is short, you use wide field refractors with large pixel sensors, your pixel scale is much larger than your seeing conditions. Oversampling happens when your pixels are tiny, your focal length is long, you're using cameras with extremely small pixels on big scopes, your pixel scale is much smaller than you're seeing. This is why camera choice depends heavily on your telescope. Here, we're on the Astronomy Tools website, inside their CCD Suitability Calculator. This is located under Calculators, CCD Suitability. If you've seen my resolution video, this calculator should look familiar as we briefly touched on it. If you haven't seen this calculator yet, this tool allows us to see where we fall as far as oversampling, undersampling, and good sampling with a particular camera and telescope combination. This is very powerful and a very good tool to use when you're choosing a camera for your telescope. If you're not familiar with how to use it, you can use the drop downs to select your equipment, or if you know the specs, you can go ahead and plug them in. For my Skywatcher 200P and Carbon Star 200, my focal length is 800 millimeters. For the camera, I'm gonna go ahead and use the drop down, scroll all the way down, and locate the ASI 2600. The seeing on this calculator is defaulted to OK seeing, which is between two and four full width half max. If you're unsure what your seeing conditions are and you're using PixInsight, you can take several subframes, throw them into PixInsight, and calculate the full width half max, and that'll give you a good idea of what to choose for seeing. For this particular example, between two and four is good because that's where I fall at my location. As we can see with the combination that we have here between the telescope, the camera, and the seeing, we're within good sampling. Now let's think back for a second to the example I gave using the grid. Seeing is important and it directly affects how we're sampling. For example, right now we're good. But if I go ahead and I shift the seeing to, let's say, good seeing, which is between one and two full width half max, we start getting close to the undersampling range. Why is that? The better you're seeing, the more stable the atmosphere is. That means photons aren't being scattered as much. If we go one step further and we go to exceptional seeing, we're in the undersampling range. This is because the atmosphere is extremely stable and the pixels aren't being spread out across the pixels as much as they should be. This is what leads to blocky stars and lost detail. If we go to the opposite end of the spectrum and we go to very poor seeing, we're in the oversampling range. This is because with very poor seeing, the atmosphere is extremely turbulent and it's scattering the photons across the pixels on the camera sensor. This is what leads to mushy stars and soft detail. Let's go ahead and put seeing back to the default and let's switch up the camera. If you've seen my resolution video, you know exactly where I'm gonna go. Let's go ahead and move this to the ASI 585. Now we went to borderline oversampling. This is because the ASI 585's pixels are smaller. This is higher resolution. And even though the seeing didn't change, the turbulence in the atmosphere that's present with OK seeing spreads the photons more on the pixels throughout the sensor. This brings us closer to the oversampling range. So if my seeing shifts worse at all, let's go to poor seeing, we're oversampling. On the flip side, if we go to good seeing, we're more within the green, we're more within the good sampling range. And that's what makes this tool so powerful because we can take 
any camera that we're looking at for our telescope and we can see exactly how it's going to react. We can see if in our normal conditions, if we're borderline and we need to be careful. So this tool is something I highly recommend when you're shopping for a camera. So now that we know what oversampling and undersampling are, what are the consequences of each and how do we tell where we stand? Oversampling leads to mushy detail, strict guiding requirements, and lower SNR or signal to noise ratio. You're likely oversampling if everything looks soft, fine details look mushy, and tiny stars look blurry no matter what you do. Undersampling leads to square stars, jagged edges, loss of fine nebula or galaxy detail, and a pixelated looking image. You're likely undersampling if stars look square, details break into blocks, edges look jagged, and the image looks low resolution even with good focus. Ideal sampling gives you crisp stars, smooth detail, optimal SNR, and easier processing, a balanced and clean image. You're in the sweet spot if stars look round and detail looks crisp. So I hope you found this video useful, and if you did and want to help support the channel, check out that join button and consider joining a Hidden Light Photography membership. There's lots of perks in it for you, and your support helps me bring you more content. Another way you can help support the channel is checking out my High Point Scientific Affiliate link if you're in the market for some new gear. It doesn't cost you anything extra, and the support helps me keep the channel growing. Also, do me a favor. That channel icon that popped up? Hit that channel icon and subscribe. I don't want you to miss out on any useful information. Drop a comment in the comment section. Did you enjoy this video? What is your current sampling? And then, check out that next video. Until the next time, clear skies.